Welcome everybody in Steelers Nation. I'm Stan Saverin. It's great to welcome in one of the most iconic, legendary figures in Pittsburgh Steelers history, John Frenchie Fuqua. Frenchie, welcome. So good to see you. Como tally vous? Uh, I'm fine. Uh, I wish I could <laughs> respond in French. I took high school French, and as you can tell, I didn't do very well at it, but I got that much down. Uh, All right, so did I. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you're more advanced. You got the nickname. Uh, I, I did not. I want to start at the beginning of your Steeler experience. You were an 11th round draft choice back when they had 11 rounds in the draft out of Morgan State, following in the footsteps of the great Leroy Kelly. You're drafted by the Giants. You spend one year there, and then you're traded to Pittsburgh. When Chuck Knoll took that team, he had to dismantle it first, and he wanted to assemble players that he knew he could win with. And I'm wondering if that boosted your confidence knowing that Chuck Knoll wanted you to be a Pittsburgh Steeler. Well, it's a long story behind that, but while I was in college, Morgan State is located Oh, about three miles from the Baltimore Coast Stadium. The first time I met Chuck, he was coaching under uh, Shula, I believe, with the coach. And I had a chance to go down there and watch a practice and talk to him. And oh, we just shot it for about 10 to 15 minutes. I had no idea that after the draft, that I would see that guy again. Well, I got drafted by the Giants, played one year there. And the next year, I was seeing this coach again. And it turned out to be Coach Snow, a guy that I have all the admiration for and respect, a great coach. Did you get a sense when you arrived for the 1970 season, Frenchie, that Chuck was building something special. Now, you know, a lot, I mean, Joe Green was already there, and then he drafts Bradshaw and Mel Blunt to come. Did you get a sense that there was something sort of brewing in Pittsburgh? Not really, and I'll tell you why. I looked at the record. I think in New York we were 7-7. Seven and seven. But I don't think Pittsburgh that year won but one game. And I said, oh, no, I'm going to the cellar of the NFL. <laughs> uh, as far as making the team, I thought I might be able to. As far as a dynasty would be concerned, it blew my mind to be a part of the building of a dynasty. 1-13, Chuck's first year. And, of course, it was onward and upward for there, from there. You know, a lot of people, you know, think about you. We'll get to this, of course, the Immaculate Reception. But you were the Steelers' starting running back for both the 70 and 71 seasons. You started 26 of the 28 games. And I'm thinking of one game in particular against the Eagles in 1970. You set the Steelers' single season, a single game rushing record, 218 yards, which was held for years until Willie Parker ended up breaking that single game. It was against the Eagles. Eagles. What do you remember about that game, Frenchie? Well, it was the last game of the season. Uh, I think we went 7-7 seven and seven that year. And I said, wow, at that time, uh, my friends, my college mates that drove up for the game, and despite the 218 or 217 years, yards it was no joy because we lost the game <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know I think that game was important to us because that following year we did much much better you had an 85 yard run in in that game and I've talked to so many players who remember all the details. Do you remember that run in particular? Yes. Uh, always lied and said I played and ran a four, four, four. Not <laughs> a number four, five, four, six, man. But I remember on one for 87 yards, the only thing I was thinking when I broke through the line, 
was, oh, no. No one's in front of me. <laughs> this is going to be a foot race. I also remember a guy by the name of a defensive back, John Outlaw. He was a track man in Detroit here. I knew he was there, and I knew he was fake. Well, I don't know where the speed came from, but I ran the whole team. And then to do it a second time, the 70 some odd yards, it made me believe I was the fastest man on the team, <laughs> which I, but it's a memory that I will cherish forever. Philadelphia being 90 miles from Baltimore. And that game, my wife at that time picked me up and drove me home back to Baltimore. But it's, it's a memory I'll have and I'll keep that. The it's only blemish, we lost. Well, it's amazing how fast you can run when someone's chasing you, right? I mean, that, that, <laughs> Correct. That, that'll get you going. Uh, you're so the lead true. running back on that football team in 70 and 71. Things start to get better. Um, you're the number one back uh, until the draft in 1972 when they draft some kid out of Penn State. Now, here, the, Frank O'Harris, you're, you're the lead running back. Do you remember your reaction when the Steelers drafted a running back number one in 72? Well, I thought they were getting him to be my blocker. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh man, great. But in training camp, you could see that this kid had a whole lot more. He was big, quick, and fast. But what a lot of people don't know, when Franco took a cheap shot from a defensive player, he got more determined. Give me the ball again. Give me the ball again. That's so-and-so. And I said, well, come on. Give him the 18 straight. Give him 19 straight. Because I'm going to punish this linebacker. But he amazed me how he picked his holes. And when he hit the pole, I mean, you're talking about 227, 230 pounds. I was amazed at how quick and how fast he was. And he would break them 25, 35, 35, 40 yards. And I'm like, hey, I said, wow. And you know, playing guard in high school as I did, I was a decent blocker. And I always knew if I kicked that linebacker up, if I hit him good, that Franco was going to make a move. I do swell, but the rest is history. He's a Hall of Famer. Was it an ego blow to have to turn into the, the blocking back for Franco? Kind of uh, a reverse on what you expected when they drafted him? Well, all through high school, I played offensive guard. I was all city, all state guard. And then when I went to college, the guards were 240, 255 yard pounds. One of our guards and the captain of our team was a guy by the name of Willie Lanier. Mm. And I couldn't, I'm a, hey, I'm 194 pounds. I couldn't compete with the offensive line. But I was a blocker. High school, I played the offensive line. College, I got a little experience at running back. Franco had played running back. He was a natural. And then I saw what the NFL was. Not only big, but fast. It was a pleasure to block for him. Uh, that's, that's, that's a great story and, and great to hear. I want to pause for just a moment on the progression of the Steelers. We're going to get to the Super Bowls and, and you know, those things, the ultimate reward. At what point in your life or at what point in your career did you begin to 
dress, shall we say, rather flamboyantly. Did you do that in high school? Did you do that at Morgan State? Or was it once you achieved some notoriety as a Steeler? No. And I'll tell you when it really started. When I bought my first pair of bell-bottom pants in New York, I said, oh, I like this stuff. I had a pretty good body at that time. 29-inch waist, 42 across the chest. No fat. And I got the Pittsburgh. And I had a guy there by the name of Chuck Lady, played safety for us. L.C. Greenwood. And these guys, and, and I could name five or six more, these guys always say, man, there's a store called Our Father's Son Boutique. They're the roughest, toughest, bell-bottom pants, jumpsuits there are. And uh, it's a novelty. I said, well, I'm not going to wear jeans to this game. I'm not going to wear my pinstripe suit. I'm going to get jazzy. And I went out, and I bought a jumpsuit. I call it my caveman jumpsuit. <laughs> and like, it was unique and different and preposterous, really. And we had a newscaster there, a radio, and the guy that narrated our, came, our games, Myron Cole. And I came out with my caveman suit, which was a skin tight lavender lever jumpsuit and I blew everybody right. Chuck Beatty safety didn't like the attention I got. And he went to Myron Cope and said, I'm the best dress on this team by far. And Myron set up a dress off. Well, that dress off led to me getting my count outfit and my nickname, Count Frenchie. I bought it at Our Father Son Boutique. It was a skin tight lavender jumpsuit with a floor length lavender cape, white buccaneer pool shoes, a three musketeer hat <laughs> with four plumes in it. And a glass cane. And we had a dress off in the stadium with the 11 most ridiculous dressers in the world. And I won it. The thing that got me was the reporters and, and the writers, they all say, there's no doubt that, Frenchie, you won this one. But what's going to happen next week? The following week, we had Mike Wagner, even Terry Bradshaw. It was 12 of us. And we all came in with preposterous outfits. I had worn my count outfit. This time it was a Poncho Villa outfit I came out with. We had played a game out in on the West Coast, we've stayed in Palm Springs. I had the opportunity to go to uh, Mexicali. I bought a Sabrero and one of the Mexican outfits that the bull was wearing. Well, I won the contest again. <laughs> and the last year we had that, the year before the Super Bowl, they said, Myron Cope said, well, Frenchie, how are you going to outdo yourself? I didn't know. They were getting things from New York, California, and I ran into a guy. Can't remember his name even to the day. And he said, Frenchie, I have exactly what you need. He said it will blow their minds. And I said, what is it? 
He said, go this shoe. <laughs> I said, what? I'll take him. That was the epitome of my dress song. We went piece by piece. Skin tight, lavender suit. Blah, blah, this and headwear. But at the end, when we put on our shoes, and that was the days of the platform. When I pulled out the goldfish shoes, got my little bag from Franco, who brought me the fish, and I dropped them in the hill. And I walked out with my cape, my goldfish shoes, and I killed the dressing competition in Pittsburgh. And that was the year before it's another Super Bowl. But, it, you know, it's great memories. It was a lot of fun. It brought all the teammates in, even the guys from down south that were Cowboys. Fresh, I was in one of the dresses. But he had his hat and his cowboy boots, et cetera. But it was a lot of fun. And we were winning. And the reason it was a lot of fun was because we were winning. And we went on to bigger and better things. No doubt, but that, uh, especially the capes and the goldfish shoes, got you a fan club, Frenchie's Foreign Legion. Um, every, team, every guy on the team just about had a fan club and groups in the stadium, Frenchie's Foreign Legion. Um, back to the football part, you said because you were winning. Obviously, if you're 1-13, those things don't go over well. When you stop and think about the first two Super Bowl wins, nine and ten, was that the ultimate for you, Frenchie, the pinnacle with all the other stuff? Was that the crowning glory? Yes, it is, and I wear my rings today with pride. Uh, to win a Super Bowl, something that I had heard of younger, when I was younger, it was the utopian of football. You know, I said, wow, but back to back. And when I came home, I was celebrated here in Michigan. It was a great feeling. And I can tell you, I have nothing but great memories of my football career. And that's just with my teammates, the people I had a chance to meet, Franco, Joe, the whole Steel Curtain, my whole team. We all had unique personalities. And it was Chuck No that brought us all together. That allowed us to have fun with the dress offs and we all intermingled together. Uh, we had an area called the Hill District, which was predominantly black. But Rocky Blyer, Mike Wagner, even Brad Shaw one or two times, would come up to the bar. And we'd have a ball. And in Pittsburgh, the bar is still open to 4 o'clock in the morning. And like at the same time, we would do the same thing, going out by the airport to Coriopolis, et cetera. And we're to mingle. I don't think there was no brotherhood that was greater than that of the Pittsburgh Steelers of the seven. And it lives on today. Uh, it continues today. Um, you might have won that first Super Bowl two years earlier in 1972. And, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about it. Uh, the Immaculate Reception, um, the greatest voted, the greatest play in NFL history. And we know your reluctance to tell your side what happened. But I, I'm curious, um, two things, Frenchie. I, I, I've told this story before um, in an uh, uh, interview I did with uh, Terry and Franco and Joe Green and Dan Rooney uh, in front of an audience. Um, Bradshaw said to Franco, tell him what you're supposed to be doing on that play. Tell him what you were supposed to And Franco sheepishly admitted, well, I was supposed to be blocking. But when I saw Bradshaw was in trouble, I kind of got out of the backfield and went down. So my question to you is, what was your assignment on that play? Okay, I was the uh, number one target on that play. I was supposed to run down the field, hook up, 
hoped that the safety came up to help the linebacker on me. And as I came across, I was wide open. They took with the deeper players. I said, wow, to myself. Well, at least I can get a first down and we can maybe get one more play in. I'm wide open. But as I went into my turn, I saw Jack Tatum, Tatum had planted his stop. And he was coming towards me. Okay, I'm turning, corner out of my eyes. I can see Tatum coming. And he was uh, the assassin, as you call him. I said, I'm going to take a blow, but I got to catch this ball. And believe me, on that play, everything went to slow motion. I looked at the field. Bradshaw was looking at me. When he looked at you, he was going to throw the ball nine or ten times. And sure enough, I thought it was tackle. He ducked. He came up. And he threw the ball in my direction. I said, well, at least if I catch it, it's a first down. And we get another crack. Sure enough, he ducked, rolled to his right, and he threw it. Now, I saw when I went into my turn, Jack Taylor at Planet. He stopped backpedaling. And I knew he was coming. First, I could hear the footsteps. And this is all taking place in slow motion in my mind. I can hear his footsteps. I said, Frenchie, you're going to take a blow. After the footsteps, I can hear him breathing. <laughs> all going on in my mind. I'm saying to myself, first of all, get between him and the ball. Bradshaw threw the ball to a point. Not to me, but to a point. The mathematics went through my mind. Hey, he got just a good chance of catching this ball as I have. So I think what we did with both myself as well as Jack, we were running towards a point. I would not be denied of getting to that point before him. Like I say, first I could hear the breathing and then the footsteps, I knew it was going to be a collision. But what I wanted to do as an offensive player was to catch the ball, of course. But number two, make sure that he didn't catch it. So we're running to a point where the ball is. The ball is in the air. We're running to the point. I got there, he got there, the ball got there. Now, who did the ball touch? If we all three got there at the same time, Jack, myself, and the ball. Well, in the NFL, this position, we all got there. There was a collision. I said, oh, no, I done blew it. Tatum was standing over me, clapping his hands. I looked up. He was smiling. And then all of a sudden, and it's like slow motion, the smile turned to a frown. He turned and started running. I'm saying, what the hell going on? <laughs> well, he got there. It wasn't pass interference. He got there. The ball got there. And I got there at the same time. 
what I would learn later, Franco caught it on his foot and went in to score the touchdown. All of a sudden, I know the referee says touchdown. He runs towards me and he says, Frenchie, Frenchie, you touched that ball. Tell him, didn't you touch that ball? I'm looking up, I'm dazed, and almost said, whatever you say, Jack. <laughs> and I collected my thoughts, and I didn't say anything. And the next thing I see is Franco going into the end zone. The question, did I touch the ball? Or did Tatum touch it? I'll never tell. And you've been true to your word. Um, does never mean forever? Might it be this decade? Or does never mean never? Well, I'm going to, when I pass on and go to heaven, there'll be a note in my casket. Uh, and like, I hope that no one opens it when I'm gone and up in heaven. But you know what the note will say? I never told. <laughs> <laughs> True to your word, I can't think of a, of a better way. We hope that's not for many, many, many years to come. Uh, we're the same age, so yeah, we don't want any of that for a good while. Frenchie, I can't tell you how much uh, I enjoyed catching up with you. I know Steelers Nation did as well. Uh, continued good health. Enjoy your retirement. Thank you so much for being with us. Entertaining, as always, the Frenchman. Thank you, Frenchman. The pleasure was mine. The pleasure was mine. Au revoir. Go Steelers. Au revoir. Go Steelers. I got a Steeler fan here. <laughs> Absolutely. Everybody is. Best Me and this guy drink coffee every morning. All right. <laughs> All right. We got a Steeler fan club going in Detroit. Thank you, gentlemen. Oh, yeah. We appreciate it. John Frenchy Fuqua. And thanks to all of you. Hope you enjoyed this most entertaining session. Thank you. Au revoir.